Okay, thanks everybody for joining us here today. Um, my name is Joshua Tucker. I am the director of the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia at NYU. And on behalf of my compatriot at the Harriman Institute, Alexander Cooley, it's a great pleasure here to welcome you today to our webinar on uh, Sputnik V and uh, vaccine diplomacy in Russia. Um, just to say a tiny little bit about what we're doing here, this is part of what's called the New York City Russia Public Policy Seminar Series, and this has been going on for a few years now. It started off with a couple of events each semester, and as we moved online, we've morphed into doing about one of these every month, um, and we've taken off uh, taking off August since the pandemic started. But these are opportunities that we have tried to do to get uh, combined scholars and practitioners together to talk about issues of pressing issues around Russia public policy. Um, and we are uh, continuing to bring these to you over the course of the semester. They're a joint effort between the Harriman Institute at Columbia and the Jordan Center here at NYU. I wanna flag that we'll have more coming the rest of this semester. Uh, in April, we're going to have one on Russia's private sector. In May, we'll be talking about, pri uh, about frozen conflicts um, and we'll be probably having more after that in June and July, and we're still working on topics for that. The way that we will approach this is we will have each of the, we've invited each of our participants here today who Alex is gonna introduce. We've invited each of our participants to give opening remarks of approximately 10 minutes. Um, we'll have the opening remarks from each of the participants. When that's done, we'll then move to questions. Sometimes maybe if, if you guys are being quiet, Alex and I will start off with some questions ourselves. If the chat box is, if the Q&A box is full, we'll move straight to questions at that point in time. Anyway, we're looking forward to having a, a super interesting discussion. I'm incredibly excited about the panelists we've been able to get here, but I'm gonna toss it over to Alex to introduce the panelists. And in the interest of keeping things moving online, uh, Alex will introduce one panelist at a time. And so each one will get their introduction before they give their opening remarks. Alex? Josh, thanks so much. Welcome, everyone. We appreciate you sharing your lunchtime or your dinner time um, with us here. So today's topic has been in the making for some time. The announcement um, last summer that Sputnik uh, V was going to be a registered vaccine uh, was uh, sent quite, uh, quite a lot of waves across both uh, public health and political circles. And there are both really interesting domestic dimensions to this, as well as international dimensions, as well as questions about research and research review surrounding Sputnik V. So these are some of the topics we brought our distinguished panelists today uh, to think about uh, and share with us. Our first panelist uh, has been commentating nonstop, and I've, I've seen her on various panels just this week. So we are so grateful to have Professor Judy Twig, who's a professor of political science at Virginia Commonwealth University, where she teaches courses on global health, on international political economy, and Russian politics. Um, and in this intersection between uh, public health policy and Russian politics, she's ideally uh, position to offer some insights into uh, the, uh, the background behind Sputnik V and some of the current issues and challenges that policymakers in Russia are thinking about. Uh, Judy, thanks so much again for joining us today. Thanks, Alex, and thanks to the Jordan Center and to the Harriman Institute for the opportunity to share the screen with such a great group of panelists. Um, so as Alex just said, Russia was the first out of the gate with a vaccine against coronavirus. We all know that Sputnik V, V for victory, um, was the first COVID vaccine in the world to be approved by a national regulator back in August of 2020. And since then, it's been rolled out widely across Russia. It's very easy to get vaccinated in Moscow. There's wide availability at clinics. Um, if you go to Goom, the luxury department store that's right off Red Square, uh, you can even get free ice cream along with your shot. So in fact, in Moscow and in other parts of Russia, it appears that supply of the Sputnik V vaccine now exceeds demand. Um, there is substantial vaccine hesitancy in Russia. Um, many people are COVID deniers. Many people just don't think that COVID is that big a deal. Um, many are anti-vaccine in general. In other words, they won't take Sputnik V, but they won't take any vaccines. And many specifically don't trust this particular vaccine. And I think Enrico will talk later about some of the questions of, of, about the data on this vaccine's safety and efficacy. But as a result, despite all the hoopla around Sputnik V, we're in a situation where actual vaccine coverage in Russia is actually relatively low compared to many other countries. Um, certainly my 
much lower than the leaders, you know, sort of Israel, uh, the UK, even the United States. Uh, according to the New York Times Global Vaccine Tracker, in terms of vaccines delivered per capita, Russia now ranks number 60, 60 in the world. So that's the domestic situation in Russia. Um, internationally, in terms of exercising soft power through the provision of vaccines, Russia clearly got off to a head start. Uh, it was aggressively marketing Sputnik V well before any of their Western vaccines had cleared regulatory hurdles. So Sputnik V is now registered in 46 countries. Um, as of today, they added North Macedonia to the list. That's the most recent one. And it's hard to keep up because the number is increasing every day. They've even made some headway in European Union countries like Hungary, Slovakia, um, before there's been official approval by the EU's medicines regulator. So there are a lot of countries that have deals to get Sputnik V doses straight from Russia. There are even more that are set to receive Sputnik V doses that are being manufactured somewhere else, India in particular, or lots of countries that are set to receive the formula and the technology so that they can make Sputnik V themselves. So what are Russia's goals here? I think there are three. Um, the first is that Sputnik V is clearly seen by Russia as a symbol of its return to great power status. It's about pride, it's about national stature, it's about respect. Um, being the first in the world to blaze the trail for the way out of this once in a century global pandemic puts Russia back on the map as a great scientific technological power, goes the Russian argument. They want to change the narrative. Russia is not some drunken backwater that relies solely on the sale of oil and gas and minerals and other things that you can dig out of the ground. And, and they portray Sputnik V this way deliberately. When the vaccine was first approved, they launched a website for it. And, and it had a feature for its first couple of weeks that the website was live, where it took a couple of seconds for the site to load. There was a built-in delay when you launched the site. And during that delay, there was a little button on the screen and it said, turn your sound all the way up and push the button. And when you push that button, you heard the audio of the beeps that were broadcast from space back in 1957, when the first Soviet satellite, Sputnik, uh, the first man-made object in space was launched. That was obviously a hallmark moment for Soviet superiority in the space race. It's no accident that they're evoking that moment now, you know, even calling the vaccine Sputnik. Um, Second, Russia clearly wants to exercise some soft power here. Uh, poor and middle-income countries are desperate for access to vaccines, and Russia realizes that obviously there's potential diplomatic benefit from appearing as a savior during this unprecedented global crisis. And in particular, Russia is contrasting its own generosity against the initial selfishness of the United States, Canada, the UK, that gobbled up all of the first available doses of Pfizer and Moderna, the other Western vaccines, through pre-purchase agreements. So the rich countries pre-purchased enough vaccine to cover their own people several times over and left the rest of the world with nothing. Now, this isn't the first time this has happened. If you think back, for example, to the early years of the HIV AIDS epidemic and the initial production of life-saving antiretroviral medications, the rich countries got those years before the millions of dying people in Sub-Saharan Africa got access to them. So Russia is very anxious right now to highlight these inequities. And then last, but certainly not least for Russia, this is a business opportunity. Um, COVID vaccines are gonna be a multi-billion dollar business. And Russia obviously would like to maximize its market share. They're offering Sputnik V at about $20 for a full course of the two doses. That's quite a bit cheaper than Pfizer or Moderna. And I also think there's a longer term set of business interests here. Russia has not traditionally been much of a player on the global pharmaceutical market. And clearly they'd like this vaccine to be a wedge to get other countries to consider, consider purchasing their other pharmaceutical products also. There's one other economic incentive here, and that is to get good vaccines to Central Asian countries that send migrant labor to Russia. They want those flows of uh, cheap labor uh, to, to reignite again, because there are jobs in Russia that need to be filled. There's a shortage of construction workers, delivery people, other jobs that are traditionally filled by migrant labor. So there's a lot that Russia wants to achieve with this vaccine, but there are a couple of important caveats here when we think about how likely it is that Russia is achieving these goals 
or is likely to achieve these goals. First is that the way Russia started with Sputnik V didn't exactly inspire confidence. Um, both international and Russian consumers have lingering doubts about Sputnik V because it was approved before it had even entered large scale clinical trials. So Russia, in a word, put the cart way before the horse with Sputnik V. And there's a perception, and it's a correct perception, that development was rushed, that Sputnik V skipped the line, so to speak. It didn't go with full of through scientific and regulatory vetting because of top-down political pressure for Russia to be first. And there was a fear that this may have impacted and be continuing to impact the vaccine's quality. So Putin took a huge gamble when he launched this thing before it was proven. And it's a gamble that appears to be paying off, but the risk was, was tremendous. Second, Russia's efforts have been able to achieve such visibility with Sputnik V because largely the traditional global health powers, the United States, Western Europe, had essentially withdrawn from this space. And this is especially an issue with the United States. There was a vacuum left by American abandonment of global health institutions, global health responsibility. And this predates the current pandemic. It goes back to the early days of the Trump administration when he uh, announced that he was leaving the World Health Organization um, and now refusing to contribute to COVAX, the international facility intended to ensure vaccine access for poor countries. Um, this left a clear opening for Russia to realize its soft power gained with Sputnik V. So the key question now is whether or not that window of opportunity is closing. Now, is it the case that Russia's golden moment, when it was the only game in town, when Sputnik V and the vaccine generosity around Sputnik V was getting all the headlines, is that golden moment already passing? Is it being supplanted, nudged aside by COVAX, that global vaccine facility, and by other bilateral deals that are starting to be cut to help poor and middle income countries, as well as the intervention from the multilateral development banks, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and others. So there are two important points here. The first is, is there was a moment not too long ago when it appeared that COVAX might not get off the ground at all. But it's clear now the Biden administration has pledged $2 billion, um, another $2 billion on the way if other countries and other donors matched. It's clear that COVAX is going to be the centerpiece for global vaccine access across the rest of this year through 2022. And I note that Russia has chosen not to participate in COVAX. It's not donating funds and it's chosen not to have Sputnik be as part of the COVAX portfolio of vaccines. Russia has said specifically that it prefers to transfer Sputnik V through the kinds of bilateral deals that it's been making. And the second point is that with Sputnik V, um, the action hasn't yet caught up with the talk, with the promises. You know, there's a lot of noise about the number of countries that have approved Sputnik V, 46 of them, like we said, but only 18 countries are actually using Sputnik V right now. And some of the biggest countries that have been promised doses, um, 125 million doses to India, 25 million to Nepal, um, I think 10 million to Brazil, those countries regulators haven't yet approved Sputnik V. So it's also important to recognize that most of the countries that have taken delivery of Sputnik V aren't entirely reliant on it. All of these countries have diversified vaccine portfolios. None is relying only on Russia. So the key question out there is how much does Sputnik V actually end up getting produced and used as production and distribution ramps up for AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, some of the other relatively inexpensive vaccines that also don't require ultra low temperatures? Um, how long is everybody's memory? You know, how much in the long term will people remember the Trump administration's selfishness? How long will they remember Russia's initial exclusivity in the realm of vaccine diplomacy? How much will they remember the scientific gamble that Russia took with premature approval of the vaccine? How lasting is the goodwill that Russia is currently achieving with these early promises? And does that newfound goodwill for Russia exist in places that are gonna be useful for Russia in the longer term? So last point I'll make in, in closing is that when we come back to the big picture, obviously the most important perspective is that the world just needs as many good vaccines as we can get deployed as quickly as we can deploy them, no matter where they come from. 
And in that sense, it's kind of unfortunate that the tenor of the conversation has been so much about competition rather than collaboration. And Russia makes this point all the time, right? Sputnik V's official tagline is that it's the vaccine for all mankind. But that's a little disingenuous since Russia's saying this, while it's clearly out there touting the superiority of its own vaccine and something that I'm sure we'll talk about later, even engaging in disinformation about Western vaccines, especially about the Pfizer vaccine. So I'm sure we'll come back to a lot of these points in detail later on, but thank you for the opportunity to uh, contribute some opening thoughts. Judy, thanks so much. And as you talk about the good of all mankind. I'm reminded today, of course, is International Women's Day. So happy International Women's Day to everyone. And as one of our Q&A has already pointed out, did you know that 17 out of 31 key members of the Sputnik V development team are women? Uh, thank you, Marina, for pointing that out. Uh, next, we go to Josh Yaffa. I'd like to say our own Josh Yaffa, but of course, uh, I, you know, we would say that. But uh, we're so grateful every time he comes to share his insights for our for us, and I would point everyone to uh, an article, uh, his deep dive in New Yorker earlier in February on this race in Sputnik uh, development. Uh, Josh, uh, thanks again for joining us, and we're uh, we're really eager to get your thoughts on uh, the inside track of how Sputnik came about. Uh, thanks, Alex, for the invitation, and, and Josh as well for the. Uh... Uh, invitation and, and glad to uh, be here and get a chance to talk about uh, Sputnik, such an esteemed panel of uh, guests. So indeed, uh, I spent several months or, or more really, um, starting in the summer, right around uh, or shortly after Putin's surprise uh, announcement uh, that Judy mentioned in her talks that, that Sputnik was in fact registered and the world's first registered vaccine that caught my attention, that caught everyone's attention it was at a time, if we remember when the uh, leading Western vaccine programs, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, were all months away from even applying for a registration. And the Sputnik uh, approval really came out of nowhere and um, caused uh, both a lot of interest and a lot of concern, and, and on my part, uh, a desire to understand exactly uh, what was this vaccine, uh, what role was it likely to play in Russia uh, and the world, and, and uh, what uh, kind of scientific properties did it have, uh, how much did it resemble other vaccines and what can we say about its likely uh, efficacy? I ended up having the chance, luckily, uh, to make two visits to the Institute Gamalea, uh, the scientific center in Moscow where the vaccine uh, was developed. I, I took those trips in November uh, and December and, and was in fact able to visit the very laboratory where Sputnik uh, V was uh, developed and, and met with the director of Gamalea and the lead developer of, of Sputnik, uh, Denis uh, Legunov. Uh, it was clear to me that the scientists at Gamalei Institute were very excited about their creation, proud, um, but a little wary, and this is me reading a bit between the lines, uh, wary of the kind of uh, boosterism and um, the kind of uh, patriotic sense of world beating victory that we were hearing at the same time on Russian state TV uh, coming from Putin himself, who took every opportunity he could find to remind audiences that not only had Russia come up with a uh, successful and apparently uh, effective as he uh, claimed vaccine, but also the first vaccine. That, that question of being first was repeated over and over and over again on uh, state television and by uh, Russian officials in a way that Judy uh, very uh, cogently and convincingly spoke about and I'll add a bit more to later. I think that that campaign of um, boosterism in a way uh, played against Sputnik, at least for a domestic audience, but I think also internationally. I think a, a, a more toned down rollout campaign would have actually served Russia's interests more than the real um, chest beating uh, victory lap that it ended up taking. Uh, uh, quickly about the vaccine uh, itself. Uh, the, the construction, as it were, of Sputnik V is based on two earlier vaccine prototypes that the Gamalei Institute uh, created in recent years. Uh, the first one was a vaccine for Ebola, um, and in the summer of 2017, the Gamalei Institute sent uh, a couple thousand doses of their Ebola vaccine to Guinea uh, for a phase three trial. Uh, the problem was that by that point in the national epidemic in Guinea, uh, Ebola had largely petered out, so it meant it wasn't really possible uh, to carry out uh, a phase three trial. So. Um, with, despite Gamalea claiming success, that was a case where it was unclear uh, you know, exactly how and if the, the Ebola 
vaccine worked. The same story repeated itself a year later with the Gamalaya uh, vaccine for MERS, uh, a kind of related, somewhat precursor to uh, coronavirus. Uh, but that outbreak also subsided, thankfully, uh, not turning into the kind of global pandemic that coronavirus did. And so that vaccine prototype uh, also didn't really uh, go anywhere, didn't reach a phase two trial or even feature in scientific journals uh, abroad. So the reputation, uh, as far as I could tell from talking to international expert, experts of Institute Gamalei was that uh, a place staffed by sound, educated, reasonable professional scientists, but without uh, a real proven track record uh, one way or another. Nonetheless, uh, when the coronavirus pandemic emerged, it was clear to the scientists at Gamalea how to build a coronavirus vaccine. They, they went to the same technology they had uh, for their Ebola and MERS vaccines, and that technology is uh, so-called vector uh, vaccine technology. Uh, the scientists uh, on this panel uh, and, and those watching, I'm sure, can correct my rather um, crude lay uh, retelling of what a vector vaccine is and, and how it works, but the essential uh, gist of it is that you take uh, a harmless uh, vaccine, in this case, adenovirus, a uh, virus that causes a common cold, you render it inactive and capable of multiplying, and then you uh, essentially insert uh, the spike protein, in this case of coronavirus, in previous cases, Ebola and MERS, but the vaccine that you want to inoculate against, you take the protein from that vaccine, you insert it, uh, into the, this vector, the inactivated cold virus, and then there, which functions as the vector, hence the name, and then you have a kind of uh, ready-made delivery system or delivery vehicle for uh, introducing into the body the necessary protein so as to create uh, an immune response against um, the virus that you want to be protecting against. Uh, the advantage of vector technology is it has a kind of cut and paste quality as uh, Denise Logunov and others at uh, Gamalei Institute explained. In other words, once you create this vector uh, construction, it's rather simple, at least in the world of advanced contemporary microbiology, uh, to swap out the payload, as it were. You have the, the space shuttle stays the same, um, but you swap out uh, the cargo. And so within a matter of weeks, uh, they had a prototype vaccine ready using this existing adenovirus vector platform uh, and swapping uh, out this uh, kind of cargo, as it were, uh, for the coronavirus uh, spike protein. Uh, the first vo uh, dose, uh, the Sputnik V, like uh, many uh, vaccine programs, including the, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, is a two-shot regimen. The first dose uh, is adenovirus uh, 26, which is a rather rare uh, form of uh, cold virus that most people uh, have not encountered before and therefore don't have immunity to. Uh, the second uh, shot comes or is delivered via adenovirus 5, which is a more common strain, but is believed, at least as I was able to understand, to help induce uh, long-lasting immunity by activating uh, T cells. Um, this uh, method of using two different uh, viruses uh, for a two-stage vector uh, vaccine is, is common, or at least has, has a kind of precedent and is established in science that the goal of this, and we can talk about it more for, for those who are interested, is essentially you want to uh, confuse, as it were, the immune system uh, so that it focuses on uh, the COVID-19 protein. You don't want the immune system attacking uh, the vector, uh, which would render the e efficacy of the vaccine uh, less. So uh, in that sense, the international vaccine experts I spoke to said, in theory, uh, all of this, what I just explained, the entire kind of scientific uh, approach and construction of Sputnik V looks good on paper, it makes sense. This is not a kind of um, crazy mad scientist approach to vaccine uh, technology. It's well within uh, contemporary vaccine mainstream. It's also worth saying that the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine is also a vector vaccine, and it also uses adenovirus 26 as its uh, delivery vector. So there's a lot of uh, scientific overlap uh, with some other vaccines uh, out there. That said, in talking with scientists, uh, they were judging the kind of theoretical uh, potential of Sputnik V uh, to prove effective. All of them said that uh, you know, no conclusions really of any seriousness could be drawn, of course, until we saw uh, the data. And that's where uh, the problems and questions uh, arise, I'm, I'm arose. And I'm sure that uh, Enrico will speak in much more detail about this question. Uh, I'll just um, kind of try and speed through it uh, quickly to give the, the overview, but essentially, 
this uh, approval in April, or I'm sorry, in August, August 11th of, of last year, when Putin announced on television with great fanfare that Russia now had uh, the first uh, coronavirus vaccine in the world, that, that registration happened, as Judy helpfully told us, uh, not only uh, before phase three trials had begun, but in fact, even before uh, phase one and two trials uh, had been published or had their results published in the national journal. So we essentially had no data uh, whatsoever at the time uh, of the approval. And, and once uh, that data was published first uh, in September, I believe in the Lancet, the results of the phase one and two trials were published, uh, a publication that led to uh, a great amount uh, of, um, kind of questioning and some criticism. Again, Enrico will, will speak about that in um, more uh, detail. Uh, nonetheless, from, from where I sat uh, in Moscow, uh, as uh, summer turned into fall and, and we edged closer to winter, it looked like the results uh, were promising. It, it, it seemed to me, I, I was beginning to have a gathering hypothesis that the PR rollout was a, uh, or a kind of a forced uh, and unnecessary own goal. All the hype had the exact opposite of effect of leading to a great amount uh, of suspicion uh, surrounding Sputnik V, but the science um, and efficacy was beginning to look sound uh, when, uh, for example, in uh, December, Institute Gamalea announced its preliminary efficacy uh, results, all of them above 90%. There it did seem to be a moment of comical geopolitical competition that Russia couldn't quite help itself from taking part in, and that Gamalea Institute was announcing its results uh, clearly in response to the published results quite promising and positive from Pfizer and Moderna. There was a, 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 a somewhat um, comical back and forth where you know Pfizer would announce its results on Monday, uh, Gamalea would announce its results on Wednesday, Moderna would announce its results the next week. Two days later, uh, Gamalea would announce that it even had better results. Uh, finally, the, the ultimate results that uh, Gamalea Institute settled on, the ultimate efficacy number that Gamalea Institute settled on is 91.6%. Uh, that was a figure that indeed uh, made it into uh, the Lancet uh, in February. Uh, we can talk about whether or not that kind of confirms the 91.6% uh, percentage uh, figure or not. Again, I'm sure Enrico will, will tell us more about that uh, in a moment, but nonetheless, that was certainly seen here uh, in Russia, and I think internationally, as uh, a kind of confirmation of what Russia had been saying all along, if Putin's boasting, uh, not just in August, but throughout the fall, combined with the clear uh, geopolitically tinged propaganda onslaught from Russian media, led to a, 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 some instinctual and well-founded uh, suspicion, uh, then uh, the announcement of the efficacy figures and the publication of Lancet seemed to suggest that there was actually a solid uh, scientific underpinning to the vaccine. And I would say, uh, it, it looks to me now like there has been an unfortunate uh, kind of uh, contest, uh, unfortunate for, for Russians and perhaps for other countries that could be making use of Sputnik V, that the politics and the hype have gotten in the way of a more uh, restrained and credible conversation around the science, which in the end would have done Russia much better than trying to be first to the gate and, and um, getting whatever kind of you know, geopolitical uh, credit or medal goes to uh, being first, which is clearly what um, the Kremlin was after with that announcement in uh, August. Judy spoke a lot about uh, why or, or rather how that the uh, uptake has in Russia has actually been uh, rather slow. As of today, uh, only around three and a half percent of Russians have been vaccinated compared to 17% in the US, 32% in the UK. Those numbers be maybe a bit out of date, but nonetheless, it shows that despite uh, being first uh, uh, technically or kind of officially with a registered vaccine, uh, Russia is now uh, really being uh, outpaced and, and outlapped by other countries who, who got there uh, later. Uh, I think the main reason for that, although there are many, uh, I'll highlight one, which is essentially, uh, again, the, the, the state propaganda campaign uh, worked against uh, itself. I spoke from my article in The New Yorker to Denise Volkov, who is the deputy director of the Levada Center, an institution I'm sure many of you know, um, who has done, um, uh, Volkov himself as well, the Levada Center as an institution, have done a lot of polling around coronavirus, around Sputnik V in Russia, trying to get a sense of why so few um, people, according to the Levada Center, as low as only 30% of Russians are willing to get uh, vaccinated. That's among the lowest figure anywhere in the world, uh, 
there are a few places where under a third uh, of the general population expresses an interest in being vaccinated. Russia is unfortunately near the bottom of that list. And so I asked Volkov, you know, why that might be. Uh, a lot has to do with uh, a kind of ingrained skepticism uh, toward the state going back to the Soviet period, uh, very well-founded and understandable habits of mind and habits of relating to state programs, to, to what you see on state television, to what uh, leaders, whether Putin or others, uh, decide to beat their chests about and, and speak about with great uh, pride and victory. So that tends to produce the opposite result in a lot of uh, Russian citizens. I think the main reason or the one I, I want to highlight is that uh, the state has consider, uh, continuously uh, played down the danger of coronavirus, uh, especially in recent months and certainly in recent weeks, uh, the message on state television and from state officials starting from Putin going all the way to Moscow's mayor is that the pandemic is essentially over and that Russia managed it successfully. Uh, the pandemic has come to a close. Russia is opening up. Moscow for months now has uh, been a shockingly open uh, city. You can go to the Bolshoi Theater. You can go to a nightclub. I mean, you can do uh, just about anything uh, you want. And there are a few restrictions compared uh, to pre pandemic life, you're supposed to wear masks in public and so on. But nonetheless, you can have a dinner in a packed restaurant. And the state has really pushed this message uh, of normalcy. And as Volkov told me, uh, that has led uh, to the impression among many Russians that there simply isn't a need uh, for uh, the coronavirus uh, vaccine, that people would not be convinced by a message of how great and wonderful and superior the vaccine is. They needed to be convinced by a message that in the end wasn't delivered of how dangerous uh, coronavirus is. And, and since that message uh, was missing, people don't feel the same uh, urgency or need uh, to get vaccinated as in other uh, countries. It's, it's a kind of eminently um, passable or, or, or skippable um, uh, vaccination. Uh, I'll close just by talking about my own experience. I was not under the impression uh, that, there, that the pandemic was over. I watched uh, and, and heard and, and followed with great alarm as many of my friends and acquaintances uh, were infected with coronavirus in Moscow, especially in the fall and winter second wave. It felt, felt like every day I was hearing about someone came down with the virus. Uh, a friend of mine spent a week in a makeshift hospital uh, on the territory of Vidyanha, the Soviet, um, Soviet era exhibition ground. So I felt like the virus was uh, very much an ever present uh, danger and weighing ultimately uh, the concerns and uh, questions surrounding Sputnik V, but also this feeling that the virus was uh, everywhere, and it was only a matter of time if I remained unvaccinated uh, that I too could become infected. That was at least uh, the fear that felt very re realistic to me. In late December, I decided to get Sputnik V uh, myself. It was very accessible, very easy. I showed up at a clinic with no appointment, uh, state clinic uh, in the center of Moscow, nothing but my passport, and uh, expressed my desire uh, to be vaccinated. And um, within about 10 minutes, I had a needle in my arm. Uh, three weeks later, uh, I got my second shot, uh, in, that would be uh, late uh, or mid-January. Uh, for the purposes of my own knowledge and uh, in the service of journalism, I um, took an antibody test um, uh, about three weeks after that. Uh, I seem to have antibody levels that, according to the test, are protective. Uh, I've not caught coronavirus, you know, that's of course no, um, Rico and others will wisely note that really um, means uh, nothing for the purposes of demonstrating uh, Sputnik V's efficacy or not. But nonetheless, uh, I suppose I'm now uh, somewhat invested or, or even kind of biased uh, observer of Sputnik V and that I'm counting on it uh, to protect me. But um, so far, knock on wood, uh, it seems to. Oh, great. Josh, thanks so much. And also for noting your own uh, personal experience with this as well as uh, you know, the skepticism in, in Russian society about that vaccine. Uh, next uh, speaker today, uh, I would like to welcome uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Enrico Bucci, who is uh, Director of System Biology Program of the Sparrow Health Research Organization at Temple University. He's also an adjunct professor of biology, and he uh, has been a, a quite prolific commentator on uh, some of uh, the design of the research study that was published in The Lancet, actually the two different uh, uh, publications. Uh, and he uh, was part of a team that wrote a response to the first study and also uh, has posted quite extensively some concerns with the second paper on his blog. And we'll uh, include that in the chat here. So 
uh, Enrico has kindly agreed to share with us some of those concerns uh, for sort of a wider audience. Uh, thanks so much for, for joining us today. So thank you and welcome everybody. So uh, first of all, let, let me start from one very important point. I think that uh, the science behind the, the, the Sputnik vaccine is a sound science. Uh, the problem is that you do not only need a science to be sound, you need also to prove it. And to prove in science means to show actual data in full details from which you can repeat all calculations that led the authors of a paper to, to draw their conclusions. This is not the case for both papers into the Lancet. So the very first important point is that Russian researchers refused uh, for both papers to share their data with scientific community. I'm not claiming that one has to share all single details about any single patient that is in, involved in the study. What I'm claiming is that we need to have access to such uh, an amount of data to be able to reproduce exactly the same calculations that were performed in the in the in the two papers by 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 the Russian authors. This is not the case. Indeed, uh, uh, um, Loganov, after the request, I mean, we we made we and others made multiple requests for uh, for having access to the data, and we were. I mean, we, we never got any answer by, by the, the, the researchers, but there were public uh, declaration by Loganov, which was, for example, saying that if anyone in the world, 7 billion of people are asking for access to the data, then there would be no place to, 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 to run a, a proper research. Of course, we are not simple individuals in the world, we are colleagues that are asking for having access to the data because we saw some strange patterns in the data in, in, in both the papers, in, in the first, so the phase two paper, where there were repeated patterns of data which are statistically highly unlikely. And there are several other, other, other small, uh, uh, let's say, mishaps or, or errors. And we, we, we see also some, I mean, several different problems also in the phase three. Paper. So we are kindly in a position where we see that there is something strange, let's see, and we have no way to check what's the source for those patterns we are seeing into the data because we are denied access to the data. And actually, in the second paper, so the phase three paper in February, they even added in the, in the uh, data sharing uh, uh, um, uh, wording that they would share the data after approval by several different stakeholders. And among those stakeholders, there is a so-called security department. This is unheard for science. There is no way you can, you, you can have such things like a security department approving access to the data for, for, for researchers. I mean, there's no, it's something really, really, really unheard of and something which is really also uh, 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 worrying us uh, on, on, on two levels. First, that the other themselves uh, inserted this farther, farther uh, uh, close and barrier to, to, to data access. And also that the Lancet accepted it. This is why we are currently waiting for uh, the approval of another letter we were asked to write by, by Lancet, which will address several concerns we have with the phase three paper. So that says, and one said that the, main, the major problem here is exactly what Joshua was pointing out, that they were cut in corner without uh, giving even the, the, the possibility to other researchers to check for the, the claims that are in the papers. That said, we still trust this vaccine. And this is, the reason is very simple. I mean, this vaccine is a very, I mean, there is a very clever change in a very well established technology. Instead of using only one single vaccine, like, like Joshua said, they used two different vectors for, the, for, their, for their spike proteins. In the first, in the first days, they used uh, adenovirus 26, in the second dose, they use adenovirus 5. This is very clever because the problem is that once you inject a virus, so adenovirus 26, the body will build up immunity, not only against the spike protein, but also against the vector. So if you give the second dose with this very same 
uh, vector, like for example, in the AstraZeneca vaccine, you will end up or you risk to end up with no effect at all because your immune system, system will neutralize also the vector, not only, not only the spike protein. So they change in the second dose the vector. So they, they, they carry the same protein with the second vector, which is adenovirus 5, to avoid this problem, which is a very clever move uh, and conception indeed. But you have to prove in full detail what's the efficacy of the approach is and what the uh, safety of the approach is. And actually, we are currently starting to have some real world data coming from Argentina. You may know that Argentina is one of the country which started uh, 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 vaccinating with the, the Sputnik vaccine, I, I mean, in, in, in a very large scale. Uh, and two days ago, uh, there, were, there were seven hospitals releasing the first data detailing uh, the, the, the antibody level which was formed into the, into the patients, in, sorry, into the, into the vaccinated people after uh, receiving one and then two doses of the vaccine. And what they declare and what they show in their data is that if you were previously infected by the coronavirus, then you get exactly the level of antibodies that is published into the Lancet by the Russian researchers. Instead, if you were never infected before by the coronavirus, your level of antibody, the level of antibodies forms is eight times below what has been declared and published into the Lancet. And another thing which is also interesting is about the side effects that they are, they are recording in uh, Argentina. You can go in, your, in their data sets and check, and you will see that uh, indeed there are no I mean, the percentage of serious adverse effects is not such a big deal. I mean, it's not very important, like they published. But the number of people experiencing mild uh, adverse effects is far higher than has been published. So what happened right now by, 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 by looking at these data that are just starting to arrive is exactly that they were exaggerating both the efficacy and safety. So they were... It's not that vaccine is not working. It's not that the vaccine is not a clever one. It's not that the science is not sound. It's the fact that they were hiring and they were publishing things before they were really proved and were not allowing people to check for the numbers that they were declaring. So to me, it looked like they were deciding how much the vaccine has to be declared to be, to be effective and safe. And they just put this number out uh, just because, I mean, just because Pfizer said that their vaccine had 90% efficacy, they had to declare that their own vaccine and to publish that their own vaccine had 91% efficacy and so on. The true efficacy is the efficacy you would expect for an adenoviral vaccine is fully consistent with Johnson & Johnson efficacy and fully uh, consistent also with the AstraZeneca vaccine. And there is one thing more. As I said, the first dose of the, Gam the Gamalia vaccine is adenovirus 26 with the spike protein. This is exactly the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So the first dose of the uh, Gamalia vaccine is exactly equivalent to the single dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So the problem now arises uh, when you have to produce it. When you have to produce the, the, the Russian vaccine, you really have to produce two vaccines. One based on the adenovirus 26 for the first dose, and one based on the adenovirus 5 for the second dose. And the interesting thing is that now they are starting to market what they call Sputnik light. And you know what is this, this, this Sputnik light is? Is the first dose of the Sputnik we already know. So that means is something which is completely equivalent to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is marketed as sputnik light vaccine. And they do this with very good reasons because they have all the data on security and also efficacy on the, on the variants, the South African variants of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is pretty much the same things. And they are developing and they are already in phase three starting in January, they arrived already in phase three, experiencing the so-called Sputnik life. So basically the first dose of, of, the, of the Sputnik vaccine. All those things 
has, they have nothing to do with science. They have a lot to do with, with marketing and, and soft power. Uh, uh, um, I mean, they, they, they are really trying to push hard the idea and the concept that their vaccine is best, that is ready and is cheap. While we are really interested right now as scientists in to understand what the real numbers in terms of efficacy and in terms of safety are, and we have no access to, to that. Still today, the protocol, the clinical protocol for the, for, the, for the trials was never ever released in full details. Not only that, we didn't even know exactly what is into the vaccine because the spike protein sequence which is into the vector has never been published. So we, for example, don't know whether this is, is the stabilized version of the spike protein, like for the Johnson & Johnson and the AstraZeneca vaccine or not. We still miss a lot of details. We only have this continuous campaign, which contaminated also Russian science because scientists themselves are participating into this. And they release even contradictory statements. If you look to the three uh, uh, press release they, 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 they released from September to December, they are contradictory with respect to what they have published in, into the Lancet. This is another thing which tells you that they were claiming efficacy before having analyzed in full details all, all the data. And actually right now there are three corrections published for the two papers on the Lancet. And maybe in the future there will be uh, further corrections arrive. So we have two problems. From one side, politics, which is overruling science in Russia. This is one. And from the other side, we have an important journal, which is the Lancet, which is accepting all of that. So it is accepting to have papers published without the authors providing access to the data needed, not to the full record of the clinical trials, but to the data needed to reproduce their findings, which is only a tiny amount of the overall data necessary for, for producing a clinical trial. And at this point, we think that we will learn the true efficacy and the true safety of this vaccine, which in any case, as I would repeat, is expected to have efficacy and, and safety. We will learn all of them at the expense of states like Argentina and people in, in poor country that are uh, delivering the, the, this, this particular job. We will never have access to the true data from Russia. And this is a problem, and this will be a huge problem for the credibility of the Russian science, which was, very unfortunate, also concerning the fact that the criticism, the very first criticism, uh, which were striking this vaccine at the Gamalia Institute, came from the son of the founder of the Gamalia Institute, which is Dr. Chumakov, which was already involved also in uncovering a scandal with vaccine contamination in the past. I finished. Oh, That's it. So much. <laughs> Thank you. And then our final panelist for today is Alexandra Yatsik, uh, who is uh, a fellow with uh, the Free Russia Foundation. She also has taught uh, and been a researcher at the University of Tartu, Estonia. She is a member of the group Ponars Eurasia, a group of uh, scholars who offer commentaries and has written um, a very interesting paper on the Kremlin's uh, vaccine diplomacy. Uh, and we will post that in the chat here. Um, so uh, Alexandra, thanks so much for joining us and we'll uh, turn it over to you for uh, the geopolitical international dimensions. Thank you, Alex. Um, in order to have a holistic approach to understand the Russian, uh, uh, Russian government's uh, vaccine diplomacy, it is important to look at uh, three stages uh, of uh, of of uh, of Sputnik V uh, diplomacy, so uh, and it is important to mention the initial phase uh, of the outbreak um, in April May uh, 2020, when uh, Russian government tried to uh, produce the related aid, uh, COVID-19 related aid to uh, 46 countries around the world. 
uh, and uh, chaotic responses uh, nearby the EU and beyond uh, to the extraordinarily uh, uh, epidemiological emergency created a window of opportunity for Russia to endeavor uh, this, uh, the, this situation. And uh, in Europe, Russia uh, produced aid uh, to Italy, Serbia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I think that the case uh, of Italy uh, could be interesting in terms of uh, revealing this uh, uh, this weak uh, link uh, in 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 EU COVID nineteen policy. Uh, as you know, uh, in March, uh, several plane loads of medical equipment were sent to to Italy, uh, so called from Russia with love. Uh, uh, at that moment, uh, badly virus battered Italy, uh, and these actions were uh, loudly trumpeted uh, in the Russian uh, state-controlled media uh, as, uh, as an expression of, uh, of Russia uh, generosity. But later, uh, this plan uh, backfired when the, the Italian media uh, reported that Russia's uh, one hungry four men strong team of medics included representatives of uh, uh, Russian military intelligence service, uh, Beru, and that at least 80% of uh, these supplies were useless. And uh, even more embarrassing was the re report uh, by uh, Italian uh, La Repubblica uh, in April. Uh, then the Italians were offered 200 euros uh, for recording videos thanking uh, the Russian authorities for their assistance. So uh, at that stage, uh, I would say that Kremlin was not successful uh, in its attempt to promote the Russian version of COVID-19 uh, aid. Uh, so for instance, in Serbia, uh, it was also not uh, successful because uh, it was done uh, before by China uh, when it sent uh, aircraft to Belgrade. So the second phase, uh, the second stage uh, was uh, in, in August, November 2020. And uh, this, uh, this stage is characterized by the deliberately expedited legal, uh, regulatory approval of Sputnik V uh, in order to later claim that this is the first uh, registered vaccine uh, in the world. And uh, definitely that this uh, Russian government fast track approach uh, to vaccine development reflects uh, its desire to be in the forefront of uh, the global fight uh, against COVID-19. And definitely that Kremlin uh, wanted to uh, show that Russia uh, has a, had a great power again. Um, and the, as soon as the Sputnik was domestically registered, uh, and uh, even before, as, as you know, as you mentioned, uh, before the international recognition by the scientific community, uh, the Russian direct investment fund uh, began aggressively promote uh, the Sputnik V. So that was reflected by uh, preliminary agreement uh, to supply one point. Okay, yep. good. Back good. on. Yep, perfect. Um, I'm, 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 I'm just uh, saying that um, in March, uh, as of March 7, uh, 46 countries uh, with the total population of uh, 1.2 billion people approved the use of Sputnik V on their territories. As And as uh, Judith mentioned, only 18 uh, have this. Uh, uh, to for, for using uh, and um, in its interview to Italian uh, TV channel uh, on March 7, the, the head of uh, fund uh, Kirill uh, Dmitriev said that this fund intends to cooperate with uh, Swiss company uh, Adian Pharma and Biotech uh, for joint production of Sputnik T in Italy. And by the end of March, uh, he said that uh, the fund will announce about. Uh, 20 potential uh, projects uh, with uh, 10 countries, including Italy. Uh, and uh, at the moment, it is uh, uh, a stage of negotiation with uh, France and Germany and also Austria uh, is interested in, in uh, cooperation uh, uh, with, uh, with Russia. And uh, at that uh, stage, I would say that Russia were late in submitting uh, to the vaccine uh, documentation to the European Medi Medicine Agency. And this rushed uh, regulatory approval served a specific tactical purpose, uh, which is now evident uh, when we look at the 
containers uh, that uh, we uh, were sent to different countries. Uh, and uh, if we look at that containers, we definitely see the big label, the first registered vaccine. So even uh, it was first registered uh, in Russia. Uh, and of course, it was a risky movie move uh, to be sure because the efficacy of the vaccine uh, at that, that time wasn't internationally recognized. But after the Sputnik uh, V rec uh, rec by, was recognized by uh, Lancet magazine, uh, it, it was uh, definitely a watershed moment be because it gave uh, the Sputnik the international kind of le international legitimacy. Uh, and of course, that, that worked at the promotion for Sputnik V uh, and provide the major PR benefit uh, for Russian government. Uh, and uh, it's important that uh, all of this is taking place against the backdrop of rather chaotic and very uh, uneven vaccine rollout around the globe, uh, but especially in Europe. For, for instance, uh, according to Bloomberg, uh, EU fails its vac vaccination plan as of the first quarter of uh, 2021, which threatens um, uh, by uh, loss uh, uh, at one uh, uh, hundred uh, billion euros. So interesting question, how successful uh, has been Russia's vaccine diplomacy on uh, its need abroad? If we look at, for example, Ukraine and Georgia, we see that due to uh, toxic bilateral relations uh, were a very uh, low likelihood that either of these governments will procure uh, Sputnik V. Uh, Belarus uh, will launch uh, the production of Sputnik V by the end of March. Uh, Azerbaijan uh, has Chinese vaccine. And uh, this is, again, very interesting question uh, because uh, Russian Sputnik V vaccine is now competing with the Chinese Sinovac. And this is particularly evident in Central Asia context. Uh, there's uh, also very interesting question that uh, China provides uh, uh, for free to uh, 76 countries uh, its vaccine around the world. And I didn't find any information whether uh, the Russian fund uh, provides uh, for free vaccine to, 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 to the countries. So, uh, so, so at that point, I would contradict to uh, uh, to Dudi because uh, she said that Russia demonstrating generosity, but I would say that no, because uh, China in that sense uh, demonstrates uh, the generosity because it provides uh, uh, its vaccine for free, uh, but this is not the case for for Russia. Uh, and the third uh, stage, which is also very important. Uh, in terms of understanding the, the Russia vaccine diplomacy is uh, Russia's uh, disinformation campaign uh, because um, just uh, uh, just after the, the, the first uh, Western vaccine was introduced, uh, Russia uh, started its disinformation campaign and uh, the disinformation campaign from Russia targeting the uh, uh, Pfizer uh, was uh, quite aggressive. So, for instance, according to Wall Street Journal, uh, Russia, Russian intelligence agencies have uh, mounted a campaign uh, to undermine confidence in Pfizer. For example, uh, there were four, uh, four sources that tried to uh, uh, compromise uh, Pfizer and other Western vaccines. And interesting that, for example, all kind of uh, Russian uh, intelligence agencies were involved. For instance, uh, uh, the Russia Foreign Intelligence Service, uh, the FSB, and also uh, GRU, which is the uh, Russia uh, Arm uh, Department uh, Service. And also, if we look at, for example, survey uh, done by Stratcom, uh, they also said that uh, there is a lot of uh, disinformation uh, produced by uh, Russian uh, speaking media and uh, a lot of uh, anti Pfizer narrative and also anti Moderna uh, narrative. And if we look at uh, the, the strategy that used by uh, Russian language media, uh, the, it could be characterized as uh, a half truth. Or, for example, 
to to produce a big lie about uh, about about uh, Western vaccines. And uh, to conclude, uh, um, yes, and the, it's very important that uh, the reach of the audience uh, uh, using these anti-vaccine narratives uh, uh, is uh, quite limited because uh, it relies on conspiracy theories and also groups that sharing these uh, narratives and attitudes. And um, what makes the situation worse is that there is a high uh, degree of public uh, skepticism uh, towards uh, the vaccine, for example, according to global uh, survey uh, of public attitudes towards uh, COVID-19, uh, which was conducted by Ipsos uh, in mid-December, only 43% of respondents in Russia uh, expressed their willingness to get vaccinated. And again, uh, as um, Judy, I, I, I suppose, mentioned, oh no, as Josh uh, mentioned, uh, Russian trusted uh, the, 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 the vaccination, but this is not true because, for example, even French uh, people were most uh, skeptical towards this vaccination. So if you look at uh, the data of this uh, survey, you see that uh, Russian, uh, Russians supported the vaccination, 43% uh, of Russians supported the vaccination, only 40% of French supported the vaccination. So there is a lot of uh, skepticism uh, around the, the idea of vaccination, and it is because of uh, this skepticism to, towards the COVID or COVID-19. So, and to conclude the, this, uh, this summary, uh, this observation about the uh, Russian vaccine policy, I would say that uh, with an uh, impending approval of Sputnik V uh, by MAA, uh, definitely uh, will acquire uh, the much needed legitimacy in the uh, EU. And uh, definitely it will make Russian government's promotion efforts uh, easier. Uh, and the Russian government undoubtedly hope uh, that uh, this vector will allow to normalize uh, its relation with EU. And uh, in words of the CEO of the Russian uh, Direct Investment Fund, uh, Kirill Dmitriev, in its interview to uh, France 24 channel uh, on March 7, uh, we want to vaccine uh, not to be political and that expanding its use would be one of the non-political bridges to Russia and Europe can have together. And so I would say that Russia tries to uh, to uh, switch the geopolitical idea of uh, be the first nation and be the great nation uh, that was used uh, at the first stage to the idea of normalizing uh, uh, strategy and to be uh, a partner with the West uh, in, 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 in producing vaccine. So this is a kind of more uh, governance oriented uh, strategy at that stage. Thank you. Great. So thanks so much for all to all of our panelists for uh, these incredibly informative uh, presentations. I know Alex and I, we, I had said at the beginning we had asked people to go 10 minutes, but Alex and I made a decision on the fly that because there was sort of so much basic information here for us to be communicated about the science as well, uh, we were going to let people go longer. And so I, I, for one, have learned an incredible amount in the last hour. And so I'm just incredibly appreciative of the panelists. Um, I want to begin by just, I, I, I want to offer one observation and then I'm going to jump into questions. And because we've gone so much longer, I'm going to try to handle the questions in a slightly different way than we normally do. But I'm going to try to bundle a bunch of things here. But the note that I want to mention is that I found it very interesting as someone who studies uh, mass political behavior, listening to, I think Judy and Josh both made comments along these lines about um, about the skepticism of the Russian population for its own regime's propaganda. And why I found this interesting is because there seems to be a tension here between hearing as part of this discussion about COVID and about Sputnik V in particular, right, this distrust of the regime versus what we also often get in lots of other discussions, which is, look how slick Russia's propaganda is. And even though there's all this stuff on the internet, everyone just really watches TV and the regime can convince anybody of anything they want to do using the TV, using television, 
right? That's, and we get this all the time when we're talking about propaganda, disinformation, public opinion. And then among people in particular who've been interested in Putin's what we know about Putin's approval ratings, what Putin's approval ratings mean. I, we've been having discussions about this for 10 years, which is, well, how thick or how deep is Putin's public approval, right? Like people will say, yes, I approve of Putin, but what does it really matter? And I wonder if we'll look back on this as a sign that some of this, uh, of the approval for Putin, the approval for Putin's regime was actually less deep um, than we thought, right? And, and I wonder if that's also going to be undercut by the disconnect, and here I also feel very much uh, that I'm talking about my own country, but the disconnect between what Josh was saying about the regime saying it's over, and yet all of his friends are getting COVID, right? And we have, you know, this is a thing that I think is an issue in the United States, and as we once again are watching people say that COVID's over, the pandemic is over in particular parts of the states. But I wonder if that will also be something we sort of look back on as, 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 um, as undermining credibility that's going in. All right, so that's just an observation on my part. Um, what I want to do is I want to grab right now, there's a bunch of questions and I want to flag for all of our participants. There's a bunch of questions that I would call sort of information questions in the uh, among the uh, among the in the Q and A, and these are these are information questions about like very just for kind of specific things, right? So we have one question about whether the vaccine is free in Russia. Um, is it when people are getting it in Russia, do they have to pay for it at all? And then what about people getting Sputnik V in other countries? Are these deals that are being made at the level of um, whether or not people have to pay in other countries? Uh, that was from Katrina. Uh, Peter Peter uh, Peter Rutland asks. What's the capacity for scaling up um, in Russia production? Um, Elise Giuliano responded, was responding generally to Josh, but I think we'll sort of extrapolate from her question about like, Josh, is your, is your experience unique or do most Westerners who you know in Moscow, are they now getting the vaccine? Um, and then we had another question from Vera uh, Smirnova asking, was Sputnik V really the first one or was China using it earlier? Now, rather than passing along to everyone to answer those questions, I'm just throwing those out there. If you have answers for any of those questions, when you go to answer these other questions, feel free to jump in and get any of these sort of factual details that we have here. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna sort of, there are a series, I have a series of kind of more, uh, I would call them not detail questions, but more interpretation questions and more sort of deeper dive questions. And I'd love to get through as many of them as we can. And so what I'm gonna do is throw um, a few of these out there and then go around to the panelists and the panelists can sort of uh, answer which ones they would like. So Katrina Vandenhavel asks, how important was the Lancet story in the success of distribution? So that's one question I want to put on the table. Ken Pinnell raises the question of what's going on with Russia's relationship with China here? And in particular, China also a kind of an early vaccine developer, but China makes the decision to participate in COVAX. Why is Russia not making the decision to participate in COVAX? How much is Russia, this has been cast as a kind of Russia versus the West, but could people make some comments here about Russia versus China as part of this story? Um, and then Tanatan, and I apologize if I get your, if I'm pronouncing the wrong name wrong here, um, asks uh, about in particular points to the problems with getting the vaccine in the near abroad, noticing that while Abkhazia and South Ossetia are relying on Russian vaccine supplies, Georgia has rejected Sputnik V, uh, even though there isn't any vaccine that's being distributed in Georgia. So is there something in particular Russia can do to, um, to address this lack of, of credibility or lack of support even in its own near abroad? Uh, and finally, uh, Jakob asks um, whether, and in particular uh, asked at Alexandra, um, do you think Russia has unlearned how to use soft power? And if so, why? Um, and so, um, and so, so another question in that regard. So I'm going to throw those out there. We have about 20 minutes left. Um, given everything everybody has to say, I thought we could go around to each of the speakers once, maybe in the order that they've gone. And Judy, you're going to go first, so maybe you'll knock out all as many of those detail questions I asked in the beginning. But then you can choose which are one, you know, take five minutes to respond to whichever of these in whichever way you'd like to respond right now. Otherwise, I think we're just going to lose too many questions. So Judy, you want to go first? Sure. Thanks, Josh. So hitting, hitting a few of these. Um, first, your comment about the extent to which the vaccine hesitancy in Russia speaks to a uh, you know, increasing sort of distrust of Putin or, or the shallowness of, of the, uh, the uh, 
sort of hold that Putin has on uh, on communications and, and ability to convince people to, to do things. Um, I think that we can actually go at least a little further back in the COVID pandemic and see the roots of this emerging in, um, in obviously inaccurate data that was coming out even before uh, we heard anything about Sputnik V. So you remember the controversies back from you know April, May, June about the Russian regime not reporting accurate um, sickness rates and especially death rates from COVID. And I think a lot of people both globally and in Russia were asking questions about the, the mismatch between the numbers that were being reported and what people could see around them with their own eyes. And so I, I think that distrust you know, ha has roots across the pandemic and not just with the vaccine. Um, in terms of whether that Lancet article was instrumental in getting countries to, to sign up for Sputnik, absolutely. I think there were quite a few that were on the fence that, that had questions about the data, were waiting for some kind of reliable marker that this was an opportunity worth taking advantage of. And I think quite a few took the plunge once, that, uh, once the second Lancet article came out, the one in early February that, that presented the results from the, uh, from the phase three clinical trials. Um, in terms of the price globally for not just Sputnik V, but for um, all of the vaccines that are coming available on global markets, there's not a whole lot of transparency around the uh, pricing and the terms of these deals so that we have the Russia Direct Investment Fund telling us that it's $10 a dose, $20 for the full to course treatment, but we have not seen anything in terms of the fine print of what's in these contracts, um, wh what the actual deals are that are being made with, uh, with individual countries. So I think we like put a pin in that question because we, we don't have good data on what's, uh, on what's going on here. And I'm I just, last one I'll address is, is to uh, be grateful for the question about China, because I think in terms of the overall landscape of vaccine diplomacy, it, it's hard to have a conversation conversation about Russia in isolation. I think we also have to look at COVAX, at China, and I think increasingly India we should be paying more attention to as since India is such a prominent and, and a prolific manufacturer of, of uh, generic medicines and of vaccines, uh, the role that uh, India is going to play and the soft power that India is going to be able to extract from, from the pandemic. Um, speaking particularly of China, of course, China has been a practice has been practicing pretty aggressive vaccine diplomacy. Um, China was not the first in the world to have its regulator approve a vaccine. Russia was the first to do that. But yeah, China was using its own vaccines way before that. It didn't even bother to uh, officially register or, or approve the vaccine before it just started using it in, in a big way. Um, China did sign up for COVAX very early on. I think that was an attempt to contrast to the Trump administration's not doing so. Um, its pledge to COVAX has been fairly minimal, about 10 million doses of, of Chinese vaccine. Um, and so China is still practicing vaccine diplomacy primarily through these bilateral deals uh, to uh, to places where it has interests, um, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, it, its own neighborhood in, in Asia. And in, in terms of what China and India can do relative to you know, Pfizer, Moderna, uh, some of the Western vaccines like, like AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson, um, I think we need to fast forward ahead by a few months and get out of the current situation where globally demand so far exceeds supply that everybody's happy to take whatever, whatever they can get get and move forward to a point that, you know, maybe we're not going to get there soon, but, but eventually we're going to get to a point where countries can start sort of vaccine shopping a little bit. They can be a little bit pickier about what vaccine they're going to take, much like we're starting to see emerge in the United States, right? Now that Johnson & Johnson is coming out and the reported efficacy numbers for J&J &J are a little bit lower, and, and you see some people and some uh, levels of government starting to say, yeah, you know, we'd rather have Pfizer or Moderna because their numbers are in the 90s, and we'd rather not have a vaccine like J&J &J with numbers in the 70s or, or AstraZeneca that will come along soon with numbers more in the 60s or 70s. Um, when that starts to happen, it will be very interesting to see how successful uh, some of this vaccine diplomacy turns out to be when, uh, when, it, when there's more shopping involved. Thanks. Thanks, Judy. Thanks so much. Josh, as we move over to you, there was one, I'm going to throw one more question on the heifer, which came out of the YouTube channel, which was that, um, do we know if Putin has been vaccinated at all? If so, what vaccine did Putin use? 
And if he did, why did he not use this as a kind of opportunity to go on TV and, and you know, and promote Sputnik V, unless he did in the questioner and myself are not aware of it. All right, Josh, passing over to you. I'll just throw one more thing on the plate there. I also want to return very quickly to your point about kind of propaganda and perhaps the limited efficacy of propaganda and what that says about support for the Putin system. I think that's a key uh, point for understanding uh, the longevity of the Putin system. It, it's not based on kind of deep, genuine uh, support, enthusiasm, belief in the virtue and um, kind of strength and credibility of the state. It, it's largely based in a sense of uh, lack of uh, alternatives, a favoring of stability uh, over the unknown, kind of large strategic or structural reasons that cause people to favor uh, the Putin system, warts and all, uh, rather than what may come if uh, it were to be replaced. But people are very clear-eyed about the warts. In other words, there, there's not, um, propaganda has not uh, kind of managed to dissuade or, or convince uh, the Russian people en masse that there aren't serious uh, problems and weaknesses with the Putin system. My favorite example of this comes from 2016 in the wake of the release of the Panama Papers uh, revelations, which showed uh, allegations of, uh, quite credible allegations of corruption in Putin's inner circle, billions of dollars flowing to offshore accounts, coming back to Russia in shady ways, presaging actually the Navalny's Putin's palace investigation from January. Uh, the Levada Center, which I mentioned in my talk, did a poll that showed uh, well over half of those polled thought that the allegations in the Panama Papers were either uh, entirely kind of credible, legit, seemed to be true, or at least well within the realm of possibilities. We had over half uh, of Russians surveyed saying that they thought corruption at the very top and heart of Putin's system was uh, likely or probable. That very same month, Lovada did its regular uh, polling to gauge Putin's support, at which he got a number, I forget the exact figure, but well above 80%. And I think that the fact that those two figures uh, you know, came in the same month show you a lot about the kind of cognitive dissonance that lies at the heart of the Putin system's um, uh, longevity, which is not due to a kind of um, you know, wool over their eyes um, understanding among the Russian public about you know, the nature of that system and its um, capabilities, which led to uh, the, skept the skepticism we've seen uh, for the vaccine. People can both you know, want the Putin system to stay because they fear chaos and still not at all trust uh, a vaccine uh, that has come out of that system. Um, as to some of the particulars about how the vaccine works um, here in Moscow, uh, it is interesting to note that despite that very low figure of whether it's 40%, 30% of uh, vaccine acceptance or, or readiness among the Russian population at large, it's about anecdotally in my uh, experience, about 100% among uh, Western, um, Western journalists or just Westerners living in Moscow, uh, foreigners in Moscow, again, perhaps by for following their own uh, local media that have reported on the coronavirus um, pandemic back home or um, uh, kind of a, a diet of independent uh, media here in Russia, whatever the case may be, people were rightfully and understandably freaked out about the pandemic and eager to have any uh, measure of protection they could, especially as the second wave in Moscow was quite extensive and long and the city itself seemed to be uh, taking very few, if any, precautionary measures. Um, that led just about every foreigner I know uh, in Moscow to have been vaccinated, which does come at a very an interesting contrast to the low level of support among Russians, which is also anecdotally uh, backed up by my own experience in that you know many Russian friends are not vaccinated and remain skeptical, even as my foreign friends have just about all of them gone in um, for the shot. Uh, it's free, absolutely free. Uh, I didn't pay a cent, certainly a Russian citizen uh, doesn't pay a cent, but um, I got both my shots absolutely for free at a state clinic. And it's my understanding that um, anywhere in Russia, uh, the shot is uh, delivered absolutely uh, free of charge. Judy spoke to some of the questions uh, in gray area surrounding cost internationally. So I think it's hard to speak uh, definitively about you know, what uh, the shot, uh, the vaccine may cost in foreign markets, though I understand largely we're talking about governments buying uh, Sputnik V to then deliver for free to its citizens. But that's not really a question for Russia. That's a question for Argentina, Hungary, uh, and uh, and so on. Um, as for uh, Putin, uh, glad that question came up. One of the other kind of real PR um, weaknesses and, and one of the more bizarre PR weaknesses of the rollout inside Russia is that Putin uh, has not been vaccinated. It's now March. The vaccine was approved by Putin, as we've talked about, in this really celebratory, triumphant way in August. Here it is in March. Putin hasn't been vaccinated. His spokesperson is very evasive, uh, strangely so, 
uh, on the question saying maybe Putin will do it at a later date. I don't know what is going on kind of behind the scenes. Is there some sort of strange health issue you know, we don't know about? Uh, is Putin happy to continue to live in isolation where people have to go through two week quarantine uh, before they meet him in the Kremlin? I, I don't know, you know, we don't know what's, what's going on, but certainly um, it doesn't help the vaccine's image inside Russia that the president uh, who launched the vaccine in this really celebratory public way still hasn't uh, been vaccinated by it. Uh, thanks, Josh. All right, next over to Enrico. Yeah, thank you. So uh, concerning the, the, the real production output from, from Russia, we know that uh, in 2020, the Russian direct investment fund uh, said that they are signed a contract for 2 billion and 400, 400 million doses. But reality is quite different. So there is a company in, uh, in England, in London, which is called Airfinity. They checked the contract that the, Russia, uh, the Russian had already signed. And uh, it turns out that till now they are uh, roughly signed contract for roughly uh, uh, 400 million doses, and there are maybe uh, 350 something million more that are, that are uh, uh, in tolls uh, uh, without a mission. So this is by far less than, than what has been uh, communicated. But the point is that up to December 2020, only 2 million doses were produced by, by Russia. And recently, the prime minister, which is, which is uh, Mishustin, he declared on uh, February 20, that uh, Russia has produced over 10 million doses. So this is way far from the doses that they have already promised both to Russians and to other countries. And this was recognized by Putin also already by saying that they had uh, problems with the nine companies which are in Russia involved to, to the production. This is why there's someone in uh, Argentina for low production and they are roughly uh, uh, I mean they are they are roughly and three or maybe four contracts all over the world with other companies and they are discussing uh, uh, for local production all over the world but uh, uh, also in Italy for example they were recently come uh, in Rome and discussing for, for installing a local production even before approval for from 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 the EMA so from the regulatory authorities so the thing is that right now the potential output of the full production pipeline is very low even compared to the contract they already signed okay sorry you cut out there Hello? Enrico yeah no I don't want to inter interrupt you are you finished yes yes okay great all right, thank you so much. Um, Alexandra? So I will support uh, Enrico's uh, comment because uh, the, the main problem of, of Russia uh, competition with China, for instance, it, uh, it's uh, limited capacity, uh, production capacity. So Russia pretends to compete with China uh, on the second rank uh, agents of vaccination uh, diplomacy, but uh, it is not possible because it is not possible to achieve these goals and to satisfy all promises that Russia uh, uh, done in terms of uh, producing all these uh, billions of doses. So, I mean, at, at least uh, at that moment, it is not possible and Russia struggling with uh, limitation of uh, production uh, capacity. So, uh, is it uh, possible to... Uh, use the soft power and uh, what uh, lessons uh, Russia learned uh, of using soft power. So I would say that the, the problem with the Russia soft power, uh, soft power is that there is no coherent soft power at all uh, as produced by Russia. Uh, because for example, uh, after, the Nav after Navalny's poisoning, Russia still uh, is quite successful at the geopolitical age in terms of uh, in terms of uh, vaccine diplomacy, for instance. So there is no uh, consequences uh, after Navalny's poisoning. So uh, at the same time, uh, is that soft power? I'm not sure that I think that it just kind of uh, uh, definitely not uh, not soft power as it seemed by Western Western approach. So this is kind of 
even not sharp power, but I don't know, hybrid hybrid power is produced by, by Putin's regime. And uh, I also support uh, Judith's uh, point that uh, publication in Lancet magazine was a kind of watershed point for uh, religious, uh, for justification of Russian vaccine. And it's very important for, for Russians to have this, uh, uh, to have this uh, uh, publication. Uh, and uh, answering uh, on the question about what Russia can do to uh, lack the credibility uh, in terms of uh, producing vaccine to, to, to Georgia, I think that this is uh, the, the, the political uh, thing. So, and it is very important not to uh, use Russians vaccine uh, in Georgia because of all these historical and political uh, tensions. So I, I'm not sure that Georgia will uh, will be agreed to to accept Russian Russia's vaccine. Great, thank you. So, dear colleagues and audience members, we are uh, pretty much out of time. Um, we have covered a tremendous um, sweep of both internal politics, academic politics, explained research procedures, as well as international politics. I want to thank all of our panelists today for joining us, Judy and Josh and Enrico and Alexandra. Uh, thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Uh, thank you to the audience members. Sorry we couldn't answer all of your questions, um, but this is a really important topic and something tells me we will return to this uh, in the future. So I hope you will join us for that as well as all of our other sessions here. Um, on behalf of Josh, thanks again for joining us. Thank you to Carnegie for supporting us. Uh, stay safe everyone and we shall see you uh, very soon we hope.